Tonight's Bible reading is from James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. So open your, your Bibles with me, please. That's James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. <clears throat> Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is God's word. like a scattering. Everyone's scattered all over at the moment. Um, we used to have a petition that ran down and cut off that back section, so all of you back people would normally be further forward. But never mind, we'll accommodate you. Now, I know that those of you sitting in the back are going to smell the food first, so don't let that distract you too much. Um, let's pray and ask that the Lord would help us to understand his word this evening. Lord Jesus, what a privilege it is to be found in your presence. When we consider that just over a year ago, we were unable to meet together, we are grateful that we can meet together like this. We thank you for the freedoms we enjoy in this country freedoms that sometimes we take for granted, yet we don't want to do that. For we know there are many around the world who have to meet secretly and are under the threat of great persecution, who will be meeting today under perhaps even the threat of death. And we pray that you would just protect and shield them. And we thank you that we can meet like this, not having that same threat hanging over us. And what a privilege it is to know that you who are a speaking God has revealed yourself through your word to us and finally through the Lord Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh. And so we want to take your word seriously. We don't want to dismiss it as irrelevant to us. We don't want to hide it under a bush. We don't want to ignore it when it cuts to the core of our being but we want to allow you through the power of your Holy Spirit to take your word and cause it to fall deep within our soul so that it won't just fall there and be lost, but that it would take root and grow and produce a crop, a harvest. So we commit ourselves into your hands to that end this evening. For Jesus' sake, amen. In a remote Swiss village stood a beautiful church. It was so beautiful, in fact, that it was known as the Mountain Valley Cathedral. The church was not only beautiful to look at with its high pillars and magnificent stained glass windows, but had the most beautiful pipe organ in the whole region. And people would come from miles away, far off lands, to hear the tones of that organ. But there was a problem. The columns were still there, the windows still dazzled with the sunlight, but there was an eerie silence. The organ no longer played. Something had gone wrong. Musicians and experts from around the world had come to this little village and tried to repair the organ, but none of them had had any success. One day an old man appeared at the door of this church he spoke with the sexton, and after some time with him, the sexton reluctantly agreed to allow this old man to go into the church and have a shot at repairing the organ. For two days, he worked and worked in almost total silence. The sexton was getting a bit nervous. Then on the third day, at high noon, the mountain valley was once again filled with glorious music. 
Farmers dropped their plows. Merchants closed their stores. Everyone in town stopped what they were doing and headed for the church. Even the bushes and trees and mountains seemed to respond. After the old man had finished playing, a brave soul asked him how he could have fixed the organ. How could he restore such a magnificent instrument when others more expert than him had failed? The old man merely said, it was I who built this organ 50 years ago. I created it. Now I have restored it. What relevance does that have to this? When God brings you into relationship with himself, he takes an old broken organ and he makes it brand new. And finally, the creator begins to play the tune that you were created to play. As God takes you and fixes you and creates in you a new person, he is able through you to work so in such a way that his will and his good pleasure works out in the way in which you live so that finally you start to begin to function the way God created you to function. The problem that all of us suffer from universally is that we are broken. Sin breaks us. It deforms us. It ruins us. God comes along in the form of Jesus Christ, and then he takes us broken people, and he creates a new person, finally enabling us to enjoy him and to experience life the way that God created us to experience life. And that is only possible in a relationship with him. The problem is that even though God creates us as a new person and finally we are functioning the way we are meant to function, we still are subject to sin. We still turn away from God. We still follow our own paths. And there are times when temptations are so great that they seemingly overwhelm us. And so our relationship that has been restored with God is marred by our sin. And it is as we come back to God, and as we once again restore fellowship with Him by drawing near to God, that we once again begin to play the way that we are meant to play. And James deals with that in these verses. What happened last week? Last week, James said, don't allow the world to distract you. Don't allow yourself to get caught with one foot in the world, one foot in the church. You need to be totally sold out to God. Now he tells us how we do that. So how is it that I can function the way that God has meant me to function? What do I need to, or how do I need to respond? And he tells us. Now what I want you to notice here in this passage is all of these instructions that Peter uh, that that um, James writes all of them in the original language are commands. So I've headed my uh, my, my structure very deliberately, um, and they in the imperative, trying to urge us into action. First command is to submit. Verse seven a. This, in a sense, is the umbrella over all of the rest, all of the rest fall. If you don't submit, you're never going to get to the rest of these commands. Notice what he says, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Now, submit means to bring yourself, literally in the original, bring yourself under the control of someone else. So you surrender yourself, you hand over the reins of your life, you bring yourself under the umbrella of the person to whom you are handing over your life so that they have supremacy in all that you do. Your thoughts are subject to them. Your words are subject to them. Your actions are subject to them. Everything you do is derived from them, is directed by them, and in this case, by God. 
It is handing over every area of our lives to Him. It is allowing God to come and dwell in us so that there is no avenue of our lives that is closed off to God. God has absolute sway over absolutely everything in our lives. That's what it means to submit. Sometimes we resist submission. Sometimes we say to the Lord, I'm prepared to give you certain parts of my life, but other parts of my life I'm going to hang on to. And God says, no, you've come to me. And in coming to me, my requirement is that you surrender everything. You relinquish it. You let it go. It means allowing God's priorities to take precedence. It means ensuring that God's will is done in your life. It means bringing every thought captive to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill your mind with the Word of God so that everything you do is for Him and Him alone. Let me try and illustrate this. Our dog that has now gone to doggy heaven, when he used to go for a walk, and the boys will verify this, he would, as soon as you took him out the gate, he would get very excited, and as soon as you took him beyond the gate, on the lead, he would pull like crazy, and it was hard hanging on to him because all he wanted to do was go, 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 and in order to bring him under control, there's certain techniques that you need to learn in leading a dog outside. But as long as he was pulling and I was pulling, there was resistance to submitting to my will. Eventually, he would finally relent and start walking a little bit normally like he should have walked. But as long as he fought against me, as long as he tried to do his own thing, he and I were at odds. Now, let me ask you, are you and God at odds over something in your life? Is it your marriage relationship that has not been submitted to God? Is it your dating life? Is it the desires that you have that may well be good desires? Is it saying to the Lord, Lord, I so long to one day get married, and and here I am still single. Have you submitted that area of your life to God? When you go to the movies and watch what you're seeing on screen, is that submitted to God? The places you go, is that submitted to God? The language you use outside of the church, is that submitted to God? The music you listen to, the kind of lyrics that are filling your head, is that submitted to God? The way you dress outside of church, is that submitted to God? The way you speak when you're under pressure, is that submitted to God? Or are you and God fighting over something? Are your finances submitted to God? Have you brought that to him and said, Lord, I don't have a lot, but it's yours? Is that submitted to God? See, if you're going to enjoy a closer relationship with God, then sometimes we need to do this daily. We will bring our lives into submission to God. Secondly, the command to resist. Look at verse 7b. To resist, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, it's important, it's imperative that when temptation comes, that you and I don't just succumb, we don't just allow ourselves to be bowled over by the strength of the temptation or the nature of the temptation. Now, the reality is that for every single person sitting here, we are not going to be tempted by the same things. All of us have different strengths and different weaknesses. So that means that the devil is going to come to you uniquely so, knowing what your weaknesses are, and he's going to try and lead you astray in those areas where you don't feel strong in. 
And when that happens, we are meant to stand and resist. How do you and I resist? Is the question we need to ask. And the answer comes in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. How often, can I ask you, do you actually put these verses into practice? Finally, be strong in the Lord, in his mighty power. Why does he begin there? Because he wants you to understand that you have the mighty power of God to equip you. It's not your own strength that you have to rely upon, but it's God's supernatural power by the Spirit. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. There they are, unseen to us in the heavenly realm, seeking to get you to yield to temptation. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to Stand your ground. Hear the language. And after you've done everything to stand, you think he's trying to make a point here. Stand firm then. How? With the bout of truth buckled around your waist. In other words, it is the truth of God's word that must be so buried in your heart that that directs your every action. Don't let the false lies and the deceptive lies of the devil fool you into thinking that the temptation he has come to you with is going to bring you some kind of lasting pleasure. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. In other words, you have been given the righteousness of Christ. Allow that righteousness to direct the way in which you live. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You have the gospel. Let the gospel be the thing that you become most enamored with, most concerned with. Let you be driven by the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. Faith is the way by which we access the power of God. It is through faith in God that we experience God's power to enable us to resist. No faith, no power. And then he says, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation that you are saved. In other words, you don't operate according to the principles of the world because you have been saved, you have been cleansed, you have been made different, you are new, you have the spirit in you. You are a saved person, not a secular person who is subject to the devil and has no choice but to jump to the strings that he pulls. You're not like that. You're saved. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Allow the Word of God to be in your mouth, directed in all that you do. Then he says, and... Pray in the Spirit. That means that it's not some obscure kind of praying, that all praying comes from the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So God has equipped you to resist. How often do we wake up and go out having put on the armor of God. You know how often you do, and God knows. Thus, when we are tempted, we are told in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you other than that which is common to man. You will never, ever be so uniquely tempted that the temptation you face, only you face. There is no such thing. All temptation is common. And even though yours might be different to mine, 
The fact is someone else will have the same kind of weaknesses that you do and suffer the same temptations. When you are tempted, we have, uh, God has provided a way out so that you might bear up under it. So there is no temptation too great to overpower you. And when you are tempted, God will provide a way for you to bear up under that temptation. And so we resist. It's active. It's a command. When I was much younger and the boys were much younger and we were out visiting at a home of someone in the first church I pastored in Brown's Plains, it was hot. It was one of those humid days in Brisbane and they had a pool and we had been invited for lunch and we were at their house and they had had three other children and at one point before we had got into the pool they grabbed me to try and push me in the pool. Now I resisted with all I could. Eventually they overpowered me and in I went. That kind of resistance requires effort. You don't just become resistant by passively thinking that the armor of God just automatically appears. It requires you daily to be vigilant in putting it on. It requires you daily to be in the Word of God. It requires you daily to pray to God so that you go out there equipped, not naked. Thirdly, the command to intimacy, verse 8a. Come near to God. Sorry, before gone, and he will flee from you. When you resist, the devil flees. He goes. It's the end of it. Um, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Come near to God is a command that the believer must strive to ensure that they are implementing in their daily routines the things that enable them to draw near to God. What does that look like? It means that we set aside time to nurture our relationship with God. Relationships do not happen in a vacuum. You know that. Those of you who are married, can you remember when you first started dating? Can you remember the lengths you went to to be with the person you were dating? I remember driving 60 Ks to Janice, who lived in a city close to Johannesburg, Pretoria. And it was as if the journey was nothing because I wanted to be with her. So you make the effort. You get in the car and you drive. Every weekend, I was out towards Pretoria and back. Because you want to spend time with the person. You want to spend time with the person because you want to get to know the person. Right? Now, you cannot get to know God intimately unless you are spending time in His presence. And in order for you to spend time in His presence, you need to set aside, it doesn't matter whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. You need to set aside time to spend reading the Word, meditating upon it. For that is God's primary means by which we get to know Him. And praying, and I know praying is difficult. I met with someone in the church this past week, and they said to me, I struggle in prayer. And I said, at least you're struggling. Because prayer is struggling. It doesn't come naturally and easily. And so we, we keep making the effort. And it's through that intimacy as we make the effort that we draw nearer to God. And what does God say? He will draw nearer to you. And he will reveal more and more and more of himself to you. And there is no better place to be in the Christian life than walking closely and intimately with God. You are created, you are made to be in relationship with Him. You are created to be intimate with Him. And you will discover your full potential and the maximum amount of contentment in this life the closer you draw to God. 
Fourthly, the command to repent, verses 8b to 9. Now, hear what he says here. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, you can't read that without realizing that one of the parts of our Christian life that should be ongoing in all of us is the need to constantly be looking inwardly and repenting of our sin. The reality is we are still in a broken world. We are not the other side of eternity. And as long as we live this side of eternity, we are going to continue to struggle with sin. There is just no way of getting around that. And we will never reach the fullness of perfection in this world. That is reserved for the world to come, where no longer we will battle with sin, where no longer we will struggle having to resist. It will all be gone. But until then, we are going to fail, and we are going to fall down, and we are going to sin. But the good news is that when we do fail God, we can run to Him, and there we can lay our sins at the foot of the cross. And what James is trying to emphasize here, and you can't miss this with the various words he uses, grieve, mourn, wail, that there is a, a sober understanding and realization and um, comprehension of our sin deep within the soul. In other words, James is saying, don't just treat sin superficially. Don't treat sin lightly. Every sin you commit, no matter how small it may be, was a sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. And he had to die and pay the price for it. Therefore, don't treat sin as though it's not serious. Rather, grieve inwardly. Allow the Holy Spirit to descend into the depths of your soul to reveal those sins that are grieving to God. And allow your soul to grieve over sin. When last did you grieve over sin? And that grieving then, he says, turns into mourning and wailing. In other words, as the soul is distraught over sin, so that expression then comes outwardly. And that's not necessarily literally meaning that uh, the tears must flow, but there may well be times when you do end up in tears. Because you realize the gravity of your sin. And some people are more emotional than others, so for some it might come a little bit more naturally, for others it may not. But at least there ought to be a sense of the weight that we feel concerning our sin. And we repent. We turn away. We move in the other direction. We agree with God. We confess. We say, Lord, you're right, and I'm wrong. We don't excuse it. We don't pretend that it's insignificant. We don't try and justify it. You can justify any sin, any sin. But we turn away from it, and we run to Christ, and there we find open arms waiting to embrace, waiting to welcome us, Waiting to restore fellowship. Waiting to experience that intimacy again. And the burden is lifted. And we once again are on fellowship with God. Repentance is both a change of our inner attitudes as well as our outward behaviors. It incorporates both. And so he says, rather than engage in frivolous activities, James is not a killjoy. James is not saying it's wrong to laugh and that Christians would walk around with dull faces and, and always look unhappy and always look sad. No, 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 because elsewhere we are told to rejoice in the Lord. And we are told that being in Christ brings great joy. So Christians should exude great joy. 
But the kind of laughter that he's talking about is this frivolous laughter. This laughter of little consequence. This laughter that is grounded in seeking our own pleasures all the time. An attitude that says, I want it all and I want it now. Hedonism is the fundamental thing which he is arguing about. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, is the attitude that James is railing against. Life is more serious than that. Because we need to understand, as James does, the weight of the judgment of God against those who turn away from him and never repent. They may laugh now. They may joke. They may even mock God. But one day they will answer to him. And so James understands that. And he says, don't allow yourself to get caught up into that kind of frivolousness. But take care of your spiritual life. Remember the parable Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12. I won't won't read it, verses 13 to 21. The parable of the rich fool. The man who thought he had everything, who had all these bonds and had wealth and had it all. And said, I'm going to store it in my bonds. And the parable Jesus says, you fool. You fool. For tonight I'm going to demand your life. That's the kind of stuff he's talking about. In other words, he's saying, don't allow yourself to become so at home in the world that everything you do is driven by its desires, its principles, its ethics, its morals. Rather, when you have turned away or when you've realized your sin, turn away from it. Repent. And then finally, there is the command to humility. Verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you up. Now, I've spoken about humility many times over. It's one of those difficult things to really grasp. But what I want you to see here is you are commanded to be humble. Humility doesn't just come. It's not as if you wake up one morning and suddenly you've gone from being proud to being humble. Humble is a lifelong engagement of walking in a way that recognizes who you are in relation to who God is so that all your attitudes, behaviors, and thoughts are brought into submission to Him. Humility recognizes that all of my successes All of the things that I gain in this world, all of the things I enjoy in this world, the very enjoyment of the pleasures that I get to enjoy are all a gift of God's grace. It recognizes the very next breath I take is a gift of God's grace. It recognizes that the money I earn is a gift of God's grace. It recognizes the relationships I have is a gift of God's grace. It recognizes the very ability to think and to speak and to laugh and to have enjoyment of life is all a gift of God. It recognizes that where I live is a gift of God. It recognizes my ability to go to bed and put my head down on a pillow and sleep is a gift of God. It recognizes that when I wake in the morning, it's because God's grace has prevailed. It understands who it is in relation to who God is. And you cannot but be humbled in that situation. James 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud. He actively works against them. Humility recognizes its complete and utter dependence upon God. It is a fearful thing, says the author to the Hebrews, to fall into the hands of the living God. Then, when we humble ourselves, then it is God who lifts us up. It is God who exalts us. And then when you are exalted, you will be truly exalted because it's God who does it. 
rather than you trying to exalt yourself, rather than you trying to get credit for yourself, rather than you trying to attempt to get people to recognize you and give you the credit that you think is due. This way, God does it, and everyone knows it. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. I have to share with you a story I read on humility. If you don't humble yourself, let me tell you, it will only be a matter of time before God humbles you. And if God does it, it will be far more worse than you doing it yourself. This is a story of a pastor, true story, who was asked to speak at a certain charitable organization. After the meeting, the program chairman handed the pastor a check. I hate getting these. Whenever you speak somewhere, you get given money. And I always say to people, I'm happy to speak. I don't need money to speak somewhere. And he said, oh, I couldn't take this. The chairman said, I appreciate the honor. Uh, the pastor said, I appreciate the honor of being asked to speak. You better have this uh, better use for this money than what I have. You apply to one of those uses, he said. The program chairman asked, well, do you mind if we put it in our special fund? The pastor replied, of course not. What's the special fund for? The chairman answered, it's so we can get a better speaker next year. <laughs> God is able to humble the proudest person and bring them low. So rather than wait for God to do it, we bring ourselves in humility before God. And we humble ourselves in his presence daily, daily. And whatever we get in this life, and whatever recognition we receive, and whatever praise people might give to us, we are quick to point them back to the Lord Jesus Christ and say to him, be the glory. For whoever or whatever I am and whatever I'm able to do is all a gift from him. Humility. Christians should be defined by their humility. Is that you this evening? Are you humble before God? Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar who when in the face of being told what would happen, ignored what was told to him and stood outside and looked at his great kingdom and looked towards the heavens and said, aren't I great? Look at this kingdom I have established. And God struck him low. Seven years. He roamed around in his gardens like a wild animal until finally he lifted his eyes towards heaven and he says, now I acknowledge the Most High. And God restored him. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up. Amen. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word this evening. It really does cut to the core. But you have given us the Holy Spirit who enables us to do all these things. And so we are not left to our own end but we are subject to you, empowered by you. And so we pray that you would help us to walk in these ways, that we might draw nearer to you, that we might experience you in greater intimacy and come to experience the fullness of life that you've brought and called us to experience. Having made us into new creations, we pray, that you would help us realize the full potential of all that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you and you alone might be exalted in our lives. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now I have to apologize up front because I've chosen a bit of an obscure